Mrs. Tiflin kissed Grandfather on the side of his beard and stood while his big hand patted her shoulder. Billy shook hands solemnly, grinning under his straw mustache. I'll put up your horse, said Billy, and he led the rig away. Grandfather watched him go, and then, turning back to the group, he said, as he'd said a hundred times before, There's a good boy. I knew his father, old Mule Tail Buck. I never knew why they called him Mule Tail, except he packed mules. Mrs. Tiflin turned and led the way into the house. How long are you going to stay, Father? Your letter didn't say. Well, I don't know. I thought I'd stay about two weeks, but I never stay as long as I think I'm going to. In a short while, they were sitting at the white oilcloth table, eating their supper. The lamp with the tin reflector hung over the table. Outside the dining room window, the big moths battered softly against the glass. Grandfather cut his steak into tiny pieces and chewed slowly. I'm hungry, he said. Driving out here got my appetite up. It's like when we were crossing. We all got so hungry every night we could hardly wait to get the meat done. I could eat about five pounds of buffalo meat every night. It's moving around, does it? said Billy. My father was a government packer. I helped him when I was a kid. Just the two of us could about clean up a deer's ham. I knew your father, Billy, said Grandfather. A fine man he was. They called him Mule Tail Buck. I don't know why, except he packed mules. That was it, Billy agreed. He packed mules. Grandfather put down his knife and fork and looked around the table. I remember one time we ran out of meat. His voice dropped to a curious low sing-song, dropped into a tonal groove the story had worn for itself. There was no buffalo, no antelope, not even rabbits. The hunters could even, couldn't even, shoot a coyote. That was the time for the leader to be on the watch. I was the leader. And I kept my eyes open. You know why? Well, just the minute the people began to get hungry, they'd start slaughtering the team oxen. Do you believe that? I've heard of parties that just ate up their draft cattle, started from the middle and worked toward the ends. Finally, they'd eat the lead pair and then the wheelers. The leader of a party had to keep them from doing that. In some manner, a big moth got into the room and circled the hanging kerosene lamp. Billy got up and tried to clap it between his hands. Carl struck with a cupped palm and caught the moth and broke it. He walked to the window and dropped it out. As I was saying, Grandfather began again, but Carl interrupted him. Oh, you'd better eat some more meat. All the rest of us are ready for our pudding. Jody saw a flash of anger in his mother's eyes. Grandfather picked up his knife and fork. Oh, I'm pretty hungry, all right, he said. I'll tell you all about that later. When supper was over, when the family and Billy Buck sat in front of the fireplace in the other room, Jody anxiously watched Grandfather. He saw the signs he knew. The bearded head leaned forward. The eyes lost their sternness and looked wonderingly into the fire. The big lean fingers laced themselves on the black knees. I wonder, he began, I just wonder whether I ever told you how those thieving Paiutes drove off 35 of our horses. Oh, I think you did, Carl interrupted. Wasn't it just before you went up into the Tahoe country? Grandfather turned quickly toward his son-in-law. Oh, that's right. I guess I must have told you that story. Lots of times, Carl said cruelly, and he avoided his wife's eyes. But he felt the angry eyes on him, and he said, Of course, I'd like to hear it again. 
grandfather looked back at the fire, his fingers laced and laced again. Jody knew how he felt, how his insides were collapsed and empty. Hadn't Jody been called to big britches that very afternoon? He arose to heroism and opened himself to the term big britches again. Tell about the Indians, he said softly. Grandfather's eyes grew stern again. Boys always want to hear about Indians. It was a job for men, but boys want to hear about it. Well, let's see. Did I ever tell you how I wanted each wagon to carry a long iron plate? Everyone but Jody remained silent, and Jody said, No, you didn't. Well, when the Indians attacked, we always put the wagons in a circle and fought from between the wheels. Now, I thought, that if every wagon carried a long plate with rifle holes, the men could stand the plates on the outside of the wheels when the wagons were in the circle, and they would be protected. It would save lives, and that would make up for the extra weight of the iron. But, of course, the party wouldn't do it. No party had done it before, and they couldn't see why they should go to the expense. They lived to regret it, too. Jody looked at his mother and knew from her expression that she was not listening at all. Carl picked at a callus on his thumb, and Billy Buck watched a spider crawling up the wall. Grandfather's tone dropped into its narrative groove again. Jody knew in advance exactly what words would fall. The story droned on, speeded up for the attack, grew sad over the wounds struck a dirge at the burials on the Great Plains. Jody sat quietly watching Grandfather. The stern blue eyes were detached. He looked as though he were not very, he was not very interested in the story himself. When it was finished, when the pause had been politely respected as the frontier of the story, Billy Buck stood up and stretched and hitched his trousers Well, I guess I'll turn in, he said, and then he faced Grandfather. I've got an old powder horn and a cap and ball pistol down at the bunkhouse. Did I ever show them to you? Grandfather nodded slowly. Yes, I think you did, Billy. Reminds me of a pistol I had when I was leading the people across. Billy stood politely until the little story was done, and then he said, Good night, and went out of the house. Carl Tiflin tried to turn the conversation then. How is the country between here and Monterey? I heard it's pretty dry. Oh, it is dry, said Grandfather. There's not a drop of water in the Laguna Seca. But it's a long pull from 87. The whole country was powder then. And in 61, I believe all the coyotes starved to death. Oh, we had 15 inches of rain this year. Yes, but it all came too early. We could do with some now. Carl's eyes fell on Jody. Hadn't you better be getting to bed? Jody stood up obediently. Can I kill the mice in the old haystack, sir? Mice? Oh, sure. Kill them all off. Billy said there isn't any good hay left. Jody exchanged a secret and satisfying look with Grandfather. I'll kill everyone tomorrow, he promised. Jody lay in his bed and thought of the impossible world of Indians and buffaloes, a world that had ceased to be forever. He wished he could have been living in the heroic time, and he knew he was not of heroic timber. No one living now, save possibly Billy Buck, was worthy to do the things that had been done. A race of giants had lived then, fearless men, men of a staunchness unknown in this day. Jody thought of the wide plains and of the wagons moving across, like centipedes. He thought of Grandfather on a huge white horse, marshalling the people. Across his mind marched the great phantoms, and they marched off the earth, and they were gone. He came back to the ranch for a moment then. 
He heard the dull, rushing sound that space and silence make. He heard one of the dogs out in the doghouse scratching a flea and bumping his elbow against the floor with every stroke. Then the wind arose again, and the black cypress groaned, and Jody went to sleep. He was up half an hour before the triangle sounded for breakfast. His mother was rattling the stove to make the flames roar when Jody went through the kitchen. You're up early, she said. Where are you going? Out to get a good stick. We're going to kill the mice today. Who is we? Why, Grandfather and I. Mm. So you've got him in it. You always like to have someone in with you in case there's blame to share. I'll be right back, said Jody. I just want to have a good stick ready for after breakfast. He closed the screen door after him and went into the cool blue morning. The birds were noisy in the dawn, and the ranch cats came down from the hill like blunt snakes. They had been hunting gophers in the dark, and although the four cats were full of gopher meat, they sat in a semicircle at the back door and mewed piteously for milk. Doubletree Mutt and Smasher moved, sniffing along the edge of the brush, performing the duty with rigid ceremony. But when Jody whistled, their heads jerked up and their tails waved, they plunged down to him, wriggling their skins and yawning. Jody patted their heads seriously and moved on to the weathered scrap pile. He selected an old broom handle and a short piece of inch square scrap wood. From his pocket, he took a shoelace and tied the ends of the sticks loosely together to make a flail. He whistled his new weapon through the air and struck the ground experimentally, while the dogs leaped aside and whined with apprehension. Jody turned and started down past the house toward the old haystack ground to look over the field of slaughter. But Billy Buck, sitting patiently on the back steps, called to him, Oh, you better come back. It's only a couple of minutes till breakfast. Jody changed his course and moved toward the house. He leaned his flail against the steps. That's to drive the mice out, he said. I'll bet they're fat. I'll bet they don't know what's going to happen to them today. No, nor you either, Jody remarked philosophically. Nor me nor anyone. Jody was staggered by this thought. He knew it was true. His imagination twitched away from the mouse hunt. Then his mother came out on the back porch and struck the triangle, and all thoughts fell in a heap. Grandfather hadn't appeared at the table when they sat down. Billy nodded at his empty chair. He's all right. He isn't sick. He takes a long time to dress, Mrs. T said Mrs. Tiflin. He combs his whiskers and rubs his shoes and brushes his clothes. Carl scattered sugar on his mush. A man that's led a wagon train across the plains has got to be pretty careful how he dresses. Mrs. Tiflin turned on him. Don't do that, Carl. Please don't. There was more of a threat than a, of a request in her tone and the threat irritated Carl. Well, how many times do I have to listen to the story of the iron plates and the 35 horses? That time's done. Why can't he forget it now it's done? He grew angrier while he talked, and his voice rose. Why does he have to tell them over and over? He came across the plains. All right, now it's finished. Nobody wants to hear about it over and over. The door to the kitchen closed softly. The four at the table sat frozen. Carl laid his mush, mush spoon on the table and touched his chin with his fingers. Then the kitchen door opened and Grandfather walked in. His mouth smiled tightly and his eyes were squinted. Good morning, he said, and he sat down and looked at his mush dish. Carl 
could not leave it there. Did, did you hear what I said? Grandfather jerked a little nod. I don't know what got into me, sir. I didn't mean it. I was just being funny. Jody glanced in shame at his mother and he saw that she was looking at Carl and that she wasn't breathing. It was an awful thing that he was doing. He was tearing himself to pieces to talk like that. It was a terrible thing to him to retract a word, but to retract it in shame was infinitely worse. Grandfather looked sideways. sideways. I'm trying to get right side up, he said gently. I'm not being mad. I don't mind what you said, but it might be true, and I would mind that. It isn't true, said Carl. I'm not feeling well this morning. I'm sorry I said it. Don't be sorry, Carl. An old man doesn't see things sometimes. Maybe you're right. The crossing is finished. Maybe it should be forgotten now it's done. Carl got up from the table. I've had enough to eat. I'm going to work. Take your time, Billy. He walked quickly out of the dining room. Billy gulped the rest of his food and followed soon after. But Jody could not leave his chair. Won't you tell any more stories? Jody asked. Why, sure, I'll tell them, but only when I'm sure people want to hear them. I like to hear them, sir. Oh, of course you do. But you're a little boy. It was a job for men, but only little boys like to hear about it. Jody got up from his place. I'll wait outside for you, sir. I've got a good stick for those mice. He waited by the gate until the old man came out on the porch. Let's go down and kill the mice now, Jody called. I think I'll just sit in the sun, Jody. You go kill the mice. You, you can use my stick if you like. No, I'll just sit here a while. Jody turned disconsolately away and walked down toward the old haystack. He tried to whip up his enthusiasm with thoughts of the fat, juicy mice. He beat the ground with his flail. The dogs coaxed and whined about him, but he could not go. Back at the house, he could see Grandfather sitting on the porch, looking small and thin and black. Jody gave up and went to sit on the steps at the old man's feet. Back already? Did you kill the mice? No, sir. I'll kill them some other day. The morning flies buzzed close to the ground and the ants dashed about in front of the steps. The heavy smell of sage slipped down the hill. The porch boards grew warm in the sunshine. Jody hardly knew when Grandfather started to talk. I shouldn't stay here, feeling the way I do. He examined his strong old hands. I feel as though the crossing wasn't worth doing. His eyes moved up the side hill and stopped on a motionless hawk perched on a dead limb. I tell those old stories, but they're not what I want to tell. I only know how I want people to feel when I tell them. It wasn't Indians that were important, nor adventures, nor even getting out here. It was a whole bunch of people made into one big crawling beast, and I was the head. It was westering and westering. Every man wanted something for himself, but the big beast that was all of them wanted only westering. I was the leader. But if I hadn't been there, someone else would have been the head. The thing had to have a head. Under the little bushes, the shadows were black at white noonday. When we saw the mountains at last, we cried, all of us. 
But it wasn't getting here that mattered. It was movement and westering. We carried life out here and set it down the way those ants carry eggs. And I was the leader. The westering was as big as God and the slow steps that made the movement piled up and piled up until the continent was crossed. Then we came down to the sea and it was done. He stopped and wiped his eyes until the rims were red. That's what I should be telling instead of stories. When Jody spoke, Grandfather started and looked down at him. Maybe I could lead the people someday, Jody said. The old man smiled. There's no place to go. There's the ocean to stop you. There's a line of old men along the shore hating the ocean because it stopped them. In boats I might, sir. No place to go, Jody. Every place is taken. But that's not the worst. No, not the worst. Westering has died out of the people. Westering isn't a hunger anymore. It's all done. And your father is right. It is finished. He laced his fingers on his knee and looked at them. Jody felt very sad. If you'd like a glass of lemonade, I could make it for you. Grandfather was about to refuse, and then he saw Jody's face. Well, that would be nice, he said. Yes, it would be nice to drink a lemonade. Jody ran into the kitchen, where his mother was wiping the last of the breakfast dishes. Can I have a lemon to make a lemonade for Grandfather? His mother mimicked. And another lemon to make a lemonade for you? No, ma'am. I don't want one. Jody, you're sick. And then she stopped suddenly. Take a lemon out of the cooler, she said softly. Here, I'll reach the squeezer down to you. <laughs>